SYS presents Adventures in Online Education. Welcome online educators. You're listening to SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education, where we discuss the realities of virtual education and bring you the best tools for the job from the experts, virtual teachers like you. I'm your host, Natalie Conway. For this episode, I asked all of my previous guests who are or have been educators the same question. How do you create effective online assessments for both formative and summative purposes? Today, you'll hear their answers. I'm also happy to have SYS CEO Bo Neal back in the studio as well to reflect on what we'll hear and to discuss assessments further, including their use in online classrooms, their value to teachers, and their benefits to students. So, are you ready? Let's learn something new. First up is Tim Baddock, former elementary teacher and chief technology officer at SYS Education. Let's hear what he has to say about formative and summative assessments. Part of keeping students engaged is helping them stay motivated and develop some coping skills. That's a reflective process, so incorporating self-assessment into any assessment is a solid opportunity for engagement. So in a formative assessment, this can mean offering students a snapshot of their progress to openly comment on. What did I know before? What do I know now? What has changed? In a summative assessment, this can actually mean, well, assessing their own work. Why not offer that same rubric in student-friendly terms for the student to complete? After all, Your rubric is that fantastic and useful, right? But really, this provides a structure for academic expectations that helps the student see their work through the lens of an instructor who has a voice in their grade, rather than patiently awaiting for the mysterious score their teacher will give them during a late-night grading session. Here are Maddie Dahl and Ashley White, high school English teachers. I'm big on breaking down larger assignments into smaller chunks, so I always start my unit planning by creating my summative assessment, whether that be a project, an essay, or a Socratic seminar, and then I break that assessment into smaller formative assessments. So for example, I just had my American literature class write an essay on a novel, and before reading, I gave them the prompts. So while they were reading, I had them write down quotes that related to each of the prompts that they could use as evidence for their essay. As they were reading, they would turn in those quotes as reading checks that I could then provide feedback on. After finishing the novel, I had students look over their evidence and write a thesis statement based on their evidence that they had collected. Then we worked on outlining where they added claims and commentary, as well as organizing their general thoughts on the novel. And I made sure to provide feedback on that smaller assessment where they were then able to write a rough draft where they got feedback from both me and peers. And then finally, they turned in their final draft. So each of the little assessments turned into one bigger assessment. The entire unit took about five weeks from starting the book to turning in the final draft. I view assessments as a way to check in with students about their progress on specific skills. As an ELA teacher, so many of the standards are recycled throughout different grade levels, so it's easy to create assignments that allow students to practice and demonstrate their mastery of skills in various fun ways throughout the year. I design all of my units by planning out the summative assessment first to keep me on track with supporting students throughout the unit on mastering the skills I will teach. Then I'll work backwards and think about how to break those skills down into chunks that are easy for students to understand. Over the course of the unit, students have several opportunities to practice skills before they complete the summative assessment, sometimes for longer units especially. I have a few smaller summative assessments in one unit. 
That just helps me break down the bigger assignment into smaller parts. Students sometimes forget the different ideas or skills throughout the entire unit if I don't check in with them as we go along. From my experience, the best built formative or summative assessment is one that allows students to demonstrate their mastery of skills in the context of the real world in an authentic way. This allows for students to be engaged and understand how the subject area skills translate into their life after school. And Dr. Katie Schweitzer, elementary principal and director of special programs. I think you have to consider what you want to do with the information and design it around that. And the grade band can be a big factor as well. So for like formative assessments, it can be something as easy as a quick understanding check. For example, we use whiteboards a lot in our elementary classes. Every student has one at home. It can be an exit ticket. It can be a bell ringer activity before you start, an online game, anything like that. If you're doing a summative assessment, then I think, again, you want to think about the purpose of that information and backwards design around that. So if it's a big summative project, you want to look at a rubric that would make the most sense. If it's a skills check, a mix of answer formats that require some higher level thinking, and that can avoid the ability to just look up answers. If it's more of a diagnostic assessment or you are looking at a normed assessment, which can be really helpful in charter schools where families are more likely to opt out of state testing, and you probably lack comparable test scores to look at like schools, things like that, it might be worth purchasing a more standardized tool to use that to really get information so that you can say where your students are progressing compared to other schools or like schools or just peers their age across, you know, the state or the nation or whatever. After the break, I get to reflect on our guests' insights with Bo Neal. Stick with us. SYS is an online management company that takes a different approach. We partner with schools to manage solutions. Whether you are a district adding an online option for students or an online school looking to go in a new direction, SYS Education can help make it exactly what you need it to be with high quality products at a fraction of the cost that schools pay to other companies. We are not just an educational consulting company, we are online educators ourselves and a tech team like no other. Let us help you bring your online school experience to the next level. Find out more at syseducation.org or by emailing info at syseducation.org. Set up your free consultation meeting to discuss how SYS might be able to help your school. I want to welcome back Bone Neal, CEO of SYS Education. Thanks for coming on the show to discuss assessments with our audience. So before the break, we heard from four great educators with four different viewpoints on assessments. What did you hear that you liked? Well, first, it was great to hear from these particular people. Each one of them I've seen actually in multiple educational settings, so I can really attest to how effective they are. Sometimes when I see things online, I'm always like, but who wrote this? Where's this idea coming from? How effective Mm -hmm. is this person is? But with these educators in particular, I, I know how effective they are. Second, it was interesting to hear them all talk about assessments from their own school view. So Tim, a former elementary school teacher, is thinking about engagement and helping the students see their work, in his words, through the lens of their teacher. Yes, I really liked that idea as well. I jotted it down as a, as a note while he was speaking. I feel like any opportunity we can seize to be more transparent is really valuable. He also spoke to the students reflecting on their own work. So instead of waiting for that grade, which might seem arbitrary or random to the kid, they're thinking about how they'd grade themselves, what they've learned, what they've demonstrated well or still have to work on. And that's the heart of learning and assessment, right? I mean, we as teachers get to see where kids' skills are at, but also bring the students in on the conversation. 100%. It sort of makes students meta aware of the learning process. So a student can learn a ton of things throughout a school year and never really take note of it. But when a student becomes aware of what they've learned, that's empowering. I think it also helps the educator understand how a student feels about what they're doing, which is really important as well. We're not just teaching standards, but hopefully we're cultivating a love for Mm -hmm. learning. And if a majority of your class is giving themselves not great grades and reflecting negatively on a module or on the content, it could be an indicator that, you know, you might want to 
change that module up a bit before you teach it again next semester. Or you might want to do some work with these particular students to make sure they get back to where they need to be. Well said. I love that idea of reflection and also how you're feeling about it. How am I feeling about learning this? Because they're human and you're, you're taking that human factor into consideration. You know, reflection is essential for teachers and students alike to grow. Hard to slow down and, and to do for sure, but so powerful and mm-hmm. valuable. All right. What else did you hear today? Maddie, a high school English teacher, provides scaffolding and steps to make sure that the student is able to work to the standards she requires. And then Ashley, another high school English teacher and a literacy teacher as well, talked about chunking the work and allowing students to work in the context of the real world, which really speaks to that age old question, why do I have to learn this? Oh, gosh, yes. They both, coming from similar teaching situations, said very similar things about that backward design and chunking. When I mm-hmm. when I listened to Maddie, I thought of how her assessment model is really circular or like a loop. The student produces something. It's in the form of a formative assessment for her. But then there's this feedback that's given, then another formative assessment and feedback again. And it keeps going until the final product is created. And then there again... She's offering feedback through peer feedback and teacher feedback before the true final submission. It's a real process where mastery is not expected right off the bat. And Ashley said similar things, but brought in, as you noted, the idea of real-world application. Why are we learning this? What teacher doesn't get asked that question pretty much every week, right? I'm reading Cornelius Miner's book, We Got This, uh, right now, and he writes about that relevance as well. If kids don't see how the skills we're wanting them to learn will serve them in their own lives, the assessment won't matter. The process and product, those don't have meaning for kids, even if we follow Tim's suggestions and reflect, we'll miss the motivation and engagement that he noted. So if we're teaching them to write, say, persuasively, who are they trying to persuade or who do they want to influence? We got to use that. Or even math. That's always a biggie for assessment. And why am I learning this? Not that everything needs to be utilitarian either. Like this is for this exact purpose outside of life. But, you know, we learn hard things in math because they teach us perseverance. They help us realize we can do more than we think we can or because they teach us how to problem solve, how to study, remember that kind of thing. Oh, I love that. I guess a good rule for a teacher would be to make, whenever possible, your assessment have a real world tie-in. And in instances like algebra, where it might be difficult to do so, I think that's okay and not overwhelming if it is the exception, you know, not the rule. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's honest and, and realistic too. Well, how about what Katie said? What did you take away from her thoughts on assessment? Yes, so Katie, the administrator, took it to the function of the assessment. Like, what do you want to do with this information? The assessment should fit in size and scale. I appreciated that she mentioned using critical thinking skills and not building assessments that can be easily solved through a simple Google search. I think that's huge. There was once was a time when students had to memorize like a canon of facts, but now information is really on our phones, in our pockets, or one tab away on the computer. So I think it's important that assessments assume students can find those facts and require them to do a a higher order thinking task with those facts. For example, a good test question wouldn't be, when did Columbus quote unquote discover America? I put discover in quotes because you know people lived here. Uh, (laughs) Yes, please. But maybe you could turn it to explain both the intentional and unintentional impact the Columbian exchange had on both America and Europe. Use evidence to support your claims and cite your sources. That sort of question assumes the student will Google things and requires that they do something complicated, like synthesizing and creating, with the information they find. Yes, I have a teacher peer whose signature, I don't know if it still is, but it definitely used to be, you know, if if kids can Google the answer, you're asking the wrong question. And I love that because it's true. I know, you know, some kids might think that's a little trite, but it's true. (laughs) So I don't care. (laughs) Yeah, Katie always brings us back to earth. I feel like when we get too esoteric or idealistic in Mm -hmm. our thinking, and I love it. She's such a reality check. The whole idea of just asking why. Why am I giving this assessment? What is the purpose? That's huge. Sometimes we're just following the script, and we can be more thoughtful than that, more deliberate. You know, do we need this data to report to the state or for grade level groupings? Or do I need this data because I need to know how to prepare for my lesson later this week? Completely. I mean, are we doing this because that is what a teacher does? 
or is this assessment unto something else? What's our plan? And important to note with, you know, Katie, Maddie, and Ashley, they all mentioned backwards planning. That's sort of teaching 101, and it's just as important online. Just because we're online doesn't mean you sort of forego those things you learned in your teacher prep program. Absolutely, yeah. And that's so where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Where are we going? Why are we doing this? Let kids in on the end product too, and they're going to understand better how the smaller pieces fit together. I did a project with fifth graders a few years ago and online, and they knew right off the bat the end product was a tiny home that they designed and that they budgeted for. So all the math we learned, all the formative assessments leading up to the project were purposeful, and they knew how the skills in isolation related to the project as a whole. And the projects were impressive. Ten-year-olds were designing floor plans and budgeting for raw materials from Lowe's and (laughs) land purchases from Zillow. Real world, backwards designed for the purpose of mastering math calculation and applications. We'll have that project module linked in the show notes as well. All right, so Bo, if you were still teaching today, what's something you'd start doing differently based on what inspired you from our teachers? Great question. I think I would be more intentional about my assessments. I like Katie's admin point of view. That's not something I had as a teacher. I think I'd try to make formative assessments embedded, varied according to task and ubiquitous, and really, again, have that plan of why am I collecting this information? What am I going to do with it? And then for summative assessments, I would try to scaffold them to the level that Ashley and Maddie do. They're both masters at breaking tasks into smaller tasks and stripping away anything that isn't essential. I like that a summative assessment doesn't have to be confined to one setting or day, but you can break it up into smaller tasks. Like you mentioned before, Maddie's assessments are almost like a dialogue, like a back and forth between her and her students. And I, I really love that. And that's something that I think I would try to add to my teaching game. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm, as an active teacher now, I'm totally inspired to look again at what summative assessments I'm putting out there for students and how I can work with my co teachers to step back, scaffold, give more feedback like Maddie and Ashley do, and provide those formative assessments that are prior opportunities for kids to practice and also make the the summative task relevant. I feel there's a lot on the plate now, but but it's so doable. (laughs) Thanks for being here today, Bo. It is always fun talking shop with you. You're active on social media. How can listeners connect with you? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at SYS underscore B-E-A-U. And thanks for having me, Natalie. Always fun. Of course. (laughs) See ya. Thank you for listening to this episode of SYS Presents, Adventures in Online Education. Special thanks go out to all of my guests today, including Ashley White, Maddie Dahl, Dr. Katie Schweitzer, Tim Baddock, and Bo Neal. Today, we learned that assessments can be way more than a test. We discussed components to consider when developing online assessments, like making sure we give lots of feedback and opportunities for students to reflect on what they're learning, the importance of real-world tie-ins, the necessity to scaffold, scaffold, and scaffold some more, and to think about the usefulness of the data we as teachers are collecting with assessments. And finally, my biggest takeaway today is that we need to build assessments in ways that allow students to use Google, but for the answer to not be in Google. As always, we have links in the show notes to get you inspired to build meaningful and engaging assessments for your students. If you liked what you heard, please hit the subscribe button This podcast wouldn't be possible without our amazing team at SYS Education, including our producer, Bo Neal, and our phenomenal sound engineers, Natalie Farrell and Matt Duran. Want more? Check us out at syseducation.org slash AOE and find us on Twitter. You can find me, Natalie Conway, at AOE Natalie, and the show at SYS Presents. Thanks for listening. Remember to subscribe and always keep learning. You've got this. Thanks for 
listening.